week number five. Uh, we're going to be in Zechariah chapter eight. So you can find that. It's in the Old Testament. That'll help you a little bit. Chapter eight, and we're talking about the theme is you will be my people. And um, from the very beginning uh, to the very end, God, that we're looking at really not uh, something peripheral to God, but what's central to God. That God from the very beginning wanted to uh, uh, form a people for his own. And we see this throughout, you know, uh, and and the way it goes, we have the first slide for this. You will be my people, God says, I will be your God, and I will make my dwelling place among you. And that's what God started, that's what actually existed uh, in the first couple chapters of Genesis, that that God had fashioned these human beings, he walked with them, they were in communion with each other, uh, and they made their dwelling uh, with each other. And that was great, and that all fell apart. But God did not give up on that dream, he will not give up on that dream. Uh, When he called the people out of slavery at the Exodus, he says, I'm gonna bring you to myself. He said, and you're gonna be my people, I'm gonna be your God, and we're gonna get this thing right. And if you follow that theme all the way through scripture to, to the end of time when Jesus finally comes back, removes all marks of the curse and sin, everything is as God wants it to be. In Revelation 21, 22, he says the same things. Now the kingdom of heaven is here, and you will be my people, I will be your God, and I'm gonna make my dwelling place among you. And so this is central and core uh, to the heart of God. And the way God goes about that is through covenant. And covenant isn't some idea he picked up somewhere along the line. Covenant is an expression of the nature of God. And covenant is for keeps, God says. When I make that promise, this is what I want, this is what I'm about, is I'm going to see it through to the end. And that's what gives us confidence and rest in our life in him. Um, and so we are to experience that, to model it. And so I have it this way in my notes. God calls us to pe- a people that uh, lives in and lives out his covenanting nature. And so what God says, I'm gonna draw you in covenantally and that's gonna so shape you that you're gonna live covenantally with each other. Uh, scripture says it this way so often. The way that Jesus has loved us, which is covenantally, we are to love one another. And when we get that right, the kingdom of heaven shows up here on earth. Um, That's what God intends. We stand out when we get that right. It's different in this world. And um, we see and experience the kingdom of heaven here on earth in ways that we just simply won't otherwise. Now, I want to get into this. Um, Have you ever known anybody uh, that talked with their hands? Huh? Anybody? Get somebody like that around there, right? Uh, some of you do that. If you've ever been in a foreign country and you didn't know the language and you tried to communicate, you did a lot of talking with your hands, right? Um, I, talked to you, I taught you a word several weeks ago um, when we were talking about the Sinai covenant, and it was synopticate. Uh, the Greek word is synecdote, and what it means is the small, the piece, stands for the whole. Uh, and so when you say, uh, you know, the crown, you're talking about the monarchy. When you say the flag, you're talking about USA, right? Get that idea? Well, if you do a word study of hands in the Bible, and you'll find hundreds of references to them, and almost all of them, hands are used synecdotally. They, they, they represent not just the hands, but the whole life of the person or the whole life of the community. For instance, when Jesus says uh, in the Sermon on when he's talking about the kingdom life, uh, he says, if your hand causes you to sin, Now, your hand doesn't cause you to do anything, right? Your hand is simply an expression of your heart, which is an expression of your life. And you see that used throughout Scripture. Exodus, uh, um, not Exodus, but Moses uh, wrote one of the Psalms. Did you know that? Psalm 90. And he says in that Psalm, he says to God, strengthen us in the work of our hands. Now, he's not referencing their hands. He's saying, God, in the life that you've given us, strengthen us so that we can live it out, so we can uh, put it on display before a watching world as you so intended. There's another phrase in Scripture uh, that is the opposite, really. Uh, It says, do not let your hands hang limp. And the image that is in that is somebody that's just given up. Somebody that is so wounded or so tired or so weary or so despairing, they're like, why bother? I mean, this doesn't do any good. I don't have enough juice for another round of this, right? And the the picture there is, uh, do not let your hands hands hang limp. And uh, it's synecdotally used. But in God's reference to that, especially when it comes to living the kingdom life, he says, let your hands be strengthened. 
He's saying to us, don't give up because it's hard. Don't bail out because it gets costly. Yes, the kingdom isn't here in all of its fullness, but it is coming and it will come. So he says, let the work of your hands be strengthened. Stay at it. Stay faithful. Don't bail when it gets costly. Don't get distracted when you, know, you hear those little whisperings of Satan in your ears. Say, try this or go this way, right? He says, let your hands be strengthened. And that phrase we see many times in the reason I, I reference that is because in the passage we're going to um, look at it in Zechariah chapter 8, you find that phrase twice. And it is, it is key and pivotal in the whole scripture where God says, let your hands be strong. And what we find in Zechariah chapter 8, which is uh, really cool, what we're going to read, it's an Old Testament picture of the kingdom of heaven coming to this earth. All right? So we're going to look at that. And twice we were told to have strong hands. In other words, God says, here's what the kingdom looks like when, when you live covenantally with me and abide in me and you live covenantally with each other. This is the kind of thing that's going to take place. So we're going to look. Anybody interested in that? Seeing the kingdom of heaven come? All right, let's take a look at it. Let's um, start. Um, I'm going to read the whole chapter. Let's start with verse 1. How's that? And it says this. The word of the Lord Almighty came to me. Is that why you're here this morning? Well, that's why we're here. I mean, I hope you came to hear God speak to you because that's what he wants to do and that's what it means to be in covenant relationship. We have the privilege of hearing his voice. So before we take another step, let's go before God and ask him for that. Father, we thank you that you're here with us. You are here for us. And you have words for us, words of life, not just ideas, but words that are powerful and transformative. Words that can give us wisdom and guidance and healing and all the things that we long after and sing about and uh, have come to know about your kingdom um, and your life. You have them for us through your words, which create things, which renew things. So, Father, we come here. It may be true for each of us that, uh, that your word, the word of the Lord Almighty, comes to us individually and together as your church in Jesus' name. Amen? All right, let's keep reading. This is what the Lord Almighty says. I am very jealous for Zion. I am burning with jealousy for her. This is what the Lord says. I will return to Zion and dwell in Jerusalem. Then Jerusalem will be called the faithful city. And the mountain of the Lord Almighty will be called the holy mountain. This is what the Lord Almighty says. Once again, men and women of ripe old age will sit in the streets of Jerusalem. Each of them with cane in hand because of their age. The city streets will be filled with boys and girls playing there. This is what the Lord Almighty says. It may seem marvelous to the remnant of this people at the time, but will it seem marvelous to me, declares the Lord Almighty? This is what the Lord Almighty says. I will save my people from the countries of the east and the west. I will bring them back to live in Jerusalem. They will be my people, and I will be faithful and righteous to them as their God. This is what the Lord Almighty says. Now hear these words. Let your hands be strong so that the temple may be built. This is also what the prophets said who were present when the foundation was laid for the house of the Lord Almighty. Before that time, there were no wages for people or hire for animals. No one could go about their business safely because of their enemies, since I had turned everyone against their neighbor. But now I will not deal with the remnant of this people as I did in the past, declares the Lord Almighty. The seed will grow well. The vine will yield its fruit. The ground will produce its crops. And the heavens will drop their dew. I will give all these things as an inheritance to the remnant of this people. Just as you, Judah and Israel, have been a curse among the nations, so I will save you, and you will be a blessing. Do not be afraid, but let your hands be strong. This is what the Lord Almighty says. Just as I had determined to bring disaster on you and showed no pity when your ancestors angered me, says the Lord Almighty, so now I have determined to do good again to Jerusalem and Judah. Do not be afraid. These are the things you are to do. Speak the truth to each other and render true and sound judgment in your courts. Do not plot evil against each other and do not love to swear falsely. I hate all this, declares the Lord. The word of the Lord Almighty came to me. This is what the Lord Almighty says. The fasts of the fourth, fifth, seventh, and tenth months will become joyful and glad occasions and happy festivals for Judah. Therefore, love truth and peace. This is what the Lord Almighty says. Many peoples and the inhabitants of many cities will yet come, and the inhabitants of one city will go to another and say, let us go at once to entreat the Lord and seek the Lord Almighty. I myself am going. 
And many peoples and powerful nations will come to Jerusalem to seek the Lord Almighty and to entreat him. This is what the Lord Almighty says. In those days, 10 people from all languages and nations will take firm hold of one Jew by the hem of his robe and say, let us go with you because we have heard that God is with you. Did you notice the recurring phrase? This is what the Lord says. This is what the Lord Almighty has to say. So what happens in a community, a covenant community, that, that live with their, with their ears open and, and hearts and minds attentive to the God who speaks? You see, when God comes into the center of a community and he offers that invitation and, you know, he's done works of deliverance and acted powerfully on our behalf and, and brought us out of darkness and out of slavery. And then we were like, wow, this is amazing. And, and we say, what do we do? You know, and, and our tendency is, let's go run around and do stuff. Let's do more and let's, let's, you know, get all excited about it. And God says, if you want to know how to rightly respond, here's how do you respond. He says, let's covenant together. I want you to enter into this relationship of faithfulness with me. Uh, I want you to be part of my people. And if you abide in that and you become covenantal uh, in your life with each other, God says the kingdom of heaven will break into your life and break into this world through you as my people. And he says often in there, you know, this is what the word of the Lord says. Uh, what, is, what is it like when that happens? Zechariah 8 is what it's like. The kingdom of God shows up. Uh, and, the, and the curse of the fall, the curse of sin and death starts to get reversed in this world. Anybody want to be a part of that? Is that that attractive to anybody? It's meant to be. You see, the kingdom of God touches down, and it touches down in such a way that every pleat, every fold, uh, every nook and cranny, you know, no matter where you go among God's people, you know, if you open it up, you know, uh, the kingdom of God pops out. Uh, if you, no matter what corner there's a conversation going, if you listen in, it's the word of God, it's the truth of God, it's the heart of God being expressed there. Um, and so often, you know, um, you get into community and different kinds of community, right? Uh, and, and you pry open or you hang around long enough to see what that life is really like. And, and you go back into those barely lit recesses, you know, and you open the door and that. And it's like, ooh, you know, you want to close it up and get out of there. And you say, yeah, see, it's not what it pretends to be on the front. Not so with the covenant community of God. Every place you go, every unfold you unravel, every place you, uh, you know, get back to, no matter how out in the open or how uh, off to the side it may seem, the kingdom of heaven is there. The word of God is there. The life of God is put on display and experience in that place. I mean, that's what God intends. And that's what actually comes to bear and comes alive when we live in a covenant community with him and covenant community with each other. When God says, we started this series, when you abide in Christ, when we abide in Christ, there's fruit that comes out of that, kingdom fruit that bears the mark of God all over it. And so in this um, passage, verses nine and 13, you heard it when I read it, it says, let your hands be strong. God says, I've covenanted it to bring this about. So don't give up. Don't grow weary. Don't get distracted. Don't despair. And, and in the first part of this, he describes, you know, this reversal of what happens when we live in covenant with God and covenant community with each other, that the, the, the effects of the fall get, begin to get turned back on their ear. The kingdom of God begins to break in. And he says, um, what you're going to see is that the, this original thing, the curse, you know, and if you're familiar with the Bible, that we read about that coming through uh, Genesis chapter 3. Uh, when we walked away, and, and we corporately as a people, we individually uh, as human beings, walked away knowingly from God and the good life and rich life that he provided for us. When we said, you know what, God? I think the devil has a better deal for me. You know, uh, isn't that how the devil works, right? He says, uh, did God really say that? Didn't he, did he really mean, does he really expect you to do that, right? Uh, don't you think that God's holding out on you? And we buy that lie. And as a result, the curse, you know, enters in and grows exponentially uh, in this world as a result. And, and so um, what happens though when we live covenantally with God, with him and with each other? That stuff gets turned upside down and set right. The way God intended life to be becomes the way life actually and truly is among God's people. And the outside world sees that and they're drawn into that as we're gonna see here in a few moments. And, um, you know, he says a number of things. And God says, when I show up and my, when my word is heard and received, 
And when the people of God are so covenant related to me and with each other that their response when they hear me speak is, yes, God, yes, Lord, yes, whatever it is, wherever it is, whatever you want, whatever you're asking me to do or calling us to do or be, yes, Lord. When that is the heart of the covenant community of God, the kingdom shows up. And God says, I'm gonna turn this curse and put it on its head and I'm gonna set things right the way I wanted them to be from the very beginning. And so there's a number of places in here where we see that happen. And I want to highlight the, those with you. The first one we find actually in verse 4, then again verse 20. Uh, one thing that happens when we live covenantly with God and with each other, um, it overturns the curse of division. Our world knows how to do division and alienation well, doesn't it? I mean, that's what news is, right, all the time. There's two manifestations of that in this passage. One is the division between generations, which is, we start out with in verse 4. Then at the end, the, the division is healed between uh, cultures and races, okay? And, and he says first, the healing of generational division will come. And that's the old and young, right? And old and young, oftentimes, they don't like each other a whole lot, right? They don't like each other's ideas. They don't like each other's pace. Uh, they don't like each other's music or dress or haircuts or the way they smell and, and all those kinds of things, right? But what Zechariah is telling us here is when we get this right, when we're, we're open and attentive to the word of God, and our response is, yes, God, I, we know you, we trust you, and we love you. So whatever you ask and say, yes, that generational divide gets closed, and I love the way he puts it. Look at verse four. Once again, see, he's hearkening back to the way it was, to the, to the original intention and design. He said, once again, men and women of ripe old age will sit in the streets of Jerusalem. Any men and women of ripe old age here today? <laughs> you don't have to put your hand up. But he says, you know, how do you tell things are ripe? You know, they get wrinkly and, you know, uh, he says, you know, they got the canes and all those kinds of things. They bruise easily. And he says, they're gonna be out in the, they're out, gonna be out in the center square of town. And guess what? They're going to be surrounded by kids, and nobody's going to be shushing them. And the kids are not going to be saying, get out of the way, old man, get out of the way, old lady, right? They're going to be there, and the older is going to be you know, protective of the younger. The younger are going to be honoring of the older. And he says that divide is going to be healed when the kingdom breaks in in this world. And wouldn't that be a marvelous and wonderful thing, huh? Yeah? Old people answer it first. Young people? See, we're already healing it up, right? And that's what, that's what happens in covenant community. Uh, and you know, many of you know I'm not a, a big uh, internet computer guy, that kind of thing, right? Uh, but I do this stuff, you know, in research. And, and uh, you know, the thing about um, the internet, I think you get a lot of pre-digested ideas. And the danger in that, it makes you an instant expert about things you know nothing about. You know, huh? So, but if you Google the idea of covenant, here's what you find. It primarily talks about things that are basically cultish. Those are the things that rise on that search, right? And what that means is uh, there, the, there's these groups with very dictatorial leaders. There are these groups that are exclusive and isolated. Uh, you know, and in these groups, or maybe these groups as a whole, they're kind of identify themselves as this elite few with some secret knowledge, so they have some kind of superiority over everyone else. And in those kinds of groups, you know, whether they're cultish or just communal or whatever, the, the reality has been over time, they have never been safe places for the most vulnerable. They take advantage of people, you know. Um, but that's not so with the kingdom of God. When the kingdom of God breaks through, the most vulnerable and weakest of people get the front seats. They get the protection of the rest of the community. And God says, when we abide in him and, and, and covenant relationship and covenant relationship with each other, that's what happens. The kingdom comes. The most overlooked, the outcasts, the weakest of all get the premier seats and primary attention and the greatest protection from everyone else. I love John 13. I think it's John 13. When Jesus uh, goes into the temple and he clears it out, you know, one of the two times he does that, and it says he chased everybody out and immediately, we normally stop at that part in the story. But it says right after that, Jesus was in the temple and the lame and the sick and the broken came to him. Isn't that cool? Because prior to that, guess what? The lame, the sick, the diseased weren't allowed in to the temple place. But Jesus comes and says, that's not the kingdom. He says, where I, my kingdom exists, the lame, the broken, the hurting, 
They get the most attention. They get looked after. They get protected. The vulnerable are, you are receive the watch care of the rest. And so it heals that bridge. You know, between young and old and everyone in between. Anybody want to be part of that kingdom? Yeah, me too. And um, the next thing that happens, another place where when the kingdom breaks in, we see this um, kingdom reversal is in the experience of alienation. Uh, and we see this in verses seven and eight. He says, I will save my people from countries and I'm gonna bring them back, he says, to live in Jerusalem. Alienation is, this, is the experience of this. I'm not really home. I don't know where I really belong. And you see this from the beginning, right? Adam and Eve, when they turned their backs on God, they were banished from home. They were put out of the garden. Uh, and you see this growing. You know, his two sons, Cain and Abel, and Cain kills Abel. And, you know, Cain then, it says, it became a restless wanderer on the earth. And we still inherit that fallen condition. Even though we could be in the midst of crowds, around a lot of people, uh, so often, you know, we, we still don't have this sense of, this is where I belong. This is my true home. These are my people, right? And we do all kind of things to try to bridge that gap and fabricate what uh, one author calls pseudo-community, right? Uh, we get around, we gather around causes or cults or, or you know, we, we get digital friends or, you know, relationships of convenience and those kinds of things. But still our hearts cry, if we're honest, is I'm not home. This is temporary. But God says when we get covenant relationship with right, right we are attentive to him. We receive his word. And we're saying, yes, God, yes, God, yes, God. Guess what? He says, the kingdom comes to bear. And people discover that the, the doors are wide open. And the heavenly father, the creator of all things, says, there is a place for you at my table. It doesn't matter where you've been. It doesn't matter what you've done. Come on in. You're welcome here. This is your true home. And so that comes to bear. And by the way, just, you know, uh, in recent months, uh, and this has been the case, but more so in recent months, I have a number of people who've been visiting here, and, and I've heard this kind of statement from that when I came in, I felt like I was home. Uh, you know, that's, that's the kingdom. That's what it's supposed to be, okay? So the third place, the curse gets overturned uh, is in verse 16. And it uh, says, these are the things you are to do. Speak the truth to each other and render true and sound judgment um, in your courts. Uh, or just generally speaking, okay? And here's, here's the deal with this. In the fallen world, in the cursed condition, we distort truth and we excuse our irresponsibility. I mean, we try and we are experts at pinning fault on others, right? And, and feeling like, well, we're off the hook. Maybe we messed up some, but they messed up worse, so I'm okay and they're the ones that should get you know, the deal, right? Um, and we justify our sinfulness and our dealings with one another. But if you go back to the garden... You have this description of the, of the human beings, man and woman, Adam and Eve and God, and where they're living uh, in communion with each, other, with each other, and it said they were naked without shame. In other words, they can see and, and allow to be seen their inmost parts without fear. There's none of this, oh no, I didn't want you to know that about me, right? And, there, and there's none of this, oh boy, if I had known that about you, then I wouldn't, right? That's not there. But when sin enters in, the result of the curse, when we turn away from friendship with God and turn into rebellion and abandoning, we begin to hide, we deceive, and we blame. Right? And you see that right out of the gates in Genesis 3. I didn't do anything, God. The devil made me do it. That hissy, creepy thing that you made, right? Uh, and, and Adam's like, it wasn't me. You know, she made me do it. That, that woman you gave me, that had trouble, right? And, and that's amazing in and of itself, right? Because a few moments before that, when God, God first presented Adam with the woman, he's like, woohoo, this is great. I mean, you are such an awesome God. I mean, wow, this is incredible. I would have never dreamed this. You know, bone of my bone, flesh of flesh. Life is good from here on out. And then the fall comes, you know, and, and here's the same guy. He says, well, God, I knew from the very first moment you presented to me, this is going to be trouble, you know? She is going to be trouble. And we do the same thing unless we are abiding covenantally with God and abiding and living covenantally with each other. We stop the blame game. We do away with deception in all of its forms. We are never comfortable with hiding when the truth is the option. And that's what Zechariah says comes when we are attentive enough and abiding enough to hear God speak to us 
individually, personally, and together corporately as the people of God. Truth is going to enter in and become the fabric of our life together. It's going to, it's going to be in our bones, in our DNA. It's going to become the, the coin of the realm in all of our transactions, come what may. And not only that, he says, and you can read this, I'm not going to go into this much, but you know, along with that truth just comes you know, the, this positioning to bless. You know? God wants to build this community called his church, which is the kingdom of heaven here on earth, you know, and the instrument of that coming to bear in this world in such a way that you can pry it open in any spot. You can run into it. In fact, if someone even enters in and tries to tear it apart, what pops out is the kingdom of heaven itself in every place. Not, ah, I knew it. It's all a show. You just like everyone else. just had to wait around long enough to see that, right? But the real thing. It's turning upside down the effects of the curse and bringing the kingdom of God alive and visible here in this world. So the next thing, the next reversal, uh, verse 12. He says, your seed's gonna grow well. The vine will yield its fruit. The ground will produce its crops. The heavens will drop the dew. And he goes on with that. And this is the reversal of fruitless toil. Anybody ever have any experience in that? Or you just kind of work and work and work and you know, pour yourself out and give yourself. And it always seems that you know, the pile of bills needing paid is greater than the pile of income that's coming in, right? Or it just seems that you put in all that labor and all that effort and all that work. And at the end of the day, you see the results and say, that just doesn't seem to match up right. I thought I would get more out of this. Those are results of the curse. The fact that you never have enough time. Anybody have that deal? That's a result of the curse, folks. It really is. When we abide in God and, and you know, are in covenant relationship with him and he with us and we are hearing his voice and we are ordering our lives the way he says and we're about the business that he calls us to be about, we have enough time to do what he's called us to do. And our hearts aren't running around with a scarcity mindset but with a fullness and with a contentment that is emblematic of living in the kingdom of heaven here on earth. The things that you do, that we do together, will add up, and they will exceed you know, the logic of numbers and math and calculations. What God says is when we are abiding and we are trusting and we hear him speak and we say yes to that, the abundance will become the watchword among his people. Fruitfulness, Jesus says, is the result of that kind of abiding in him and loving each other. You want to be a part of that? Okay, verse 19, another uh, place where uh, when we're, we're listening and saying yes to God, where the curse is overturned and the kingdom comes. Um, verse 19, this is what the Lord says. The fast of the fourth, fifth, seventh, and tenth months will become joyful and glad occasions and happy festivals for Judah. So it overturns the curse of dreary spirituality. Jesus talks about this in the Sermon on the Mount, right? He says, when you fast, he says, don't go around looking like this. Look at me, I'm starving, I'm weak, I'm wobbly, you know, look at my hair. Well, my hair's always messed up. But anyway, you know, for some of you, it makes a difference. But, you know, you do that. And he says, don't go around like that. Look at me, I'm dying of hunger here, but it's for Jesus, right? You know, poor old sacrificial me, aren't I spiritual? Um, you know, uh, you, you know, you see somebody like that, and if we get, when we get this wrong, we say, well, they must really love God. And if you just think about it, if you're on the outside looking in and you see that, you say, well, that really makes me want to be a part of that community, right? That is not the kingdom of heaven. That sort of morose, whiny, bent over, self centered, chaotic spirituality, that's not what it's about. And if the, you know, that verse is in there, by the way, if you read chapter seven, you know, the kingdom was being restored, the temple, the dwelling place of God was being rebuilt. And there are people on the outskirts of that who sent, uh, you know, emissaries to find out what was going on. And they said, hey, we have these fasts that we do. Should we keep doing them? And basically, God addresses that group with a question. Should we continue to fast and mourn? And God says to them through the prophet, he says, what do you think that's all about anyway? And that's a rhetorical question because God answers it. When I watch what you do in your religious rituals, he said, it's primarily about you. What you want, what you're doing, look at me, aren't I spiritual kind of stuff. He says, that's not the kingdom. God says, you know, when you get this right and we live in that dynamic covenant relationship with him, he says, our fasts feel like feasts. 
are sacrifices, are festivals. We serve even in the most mundane of things with joy inescapable. We love even the hardest to love people with a steadfastness and, and, a, and, a, and a sense of filling out of that because we know it reflects and bears the heart of God. So we break through this dreary spirituality. You know? Anybody want any of that? He's talking about the kingdom coming. He says, the avenue is when you covenant with me and covenant with each other. Um, this is what happens. The curse gets turned on its head and the kingdom breaks in. And he says, I'm, and, and remember, who's doing all this? Who's speaking and who's bringing it about? God says, thus says the Lord Almighty. The Lord Almighty says this, right? We attend to his word, we say yes to his words, and that's how it comes to bear, right? And God says this, I'm doing all this stuff, but there's something that you have a role. This is covenant relationship. You have a part to do that. There's some things I want you to do. In verses 16 and 17, he spells them out for us. These are the things you are to do. Speak the truth to each other. Render true and sound judgment in your courts. Do not plot evil against each other. Do not love to swear falsely. I hate all this, God says. So God says, I'm doing this, and if we get this right, you're gonna be a part of it. He says, but here's what I want you to do. Stop doing what I hate. Quit lying to each other. Quit plotting evil against one another. Stop passing bad and hurtful judgments over top of each other. Stop doing what I hate. And here's what